There's an idea that I personally subscribe to, which is if you feel you really need to change the system, just do it. There are many different kind of procedural generation of games. The most common is what we call a roguelike, meaning that every time a player starts a new game, a new world is created specifically for this game. And if you die, you restart from the beginning. The core idea is to have a kind of control diversity. So you can have different layout of the world, for example. If you're playing on islands, you can have bigger, smaller islands. They can have different shapes, this kind of thing. So every time the player starts a new game, he should have a different experience. In the early stages, we were expecting to be a fairly short playthrough, and we expected people to play through multiple times. And we didn't anticipate there'd be a lot of story, you know, an introduction, a couple of midpoints, and then an ending when you got to it. Welcome Guillaume Provost from Compulsion Games to come up on stage and show off a project that's going to be launching into Xbox Game Preview next month. Guillaume? We got uh, interest to actually show the game at E3. We took stock and really came to the realization that, well, we should probably really play to our strengths. And as that, what we started preparing was the first part of the actual story content, so the actual first introduction. We've done these sorts of things before, and you know, we've put a lot of effort into shaping that. I'll fix you! We had a great response to it, and then we realized we were in a lot of trouble because that wasn't really what the rest of the game was going to be like. We put our strongest foot forward, but we didn't have that many feet left after that. Oh my lord, he's a downer. Oh, Call security, me. we've got a downer. At that point, we just really realized, well, if this is the kind of content that's going to really resonate with people, then we probably really want to emphasize the story more. We realized, well, if it's going to be more story-centric, then each playthrough is going to be longer, and then there's not as much value in playing through it multiple times. From there, it's sort of snowballed. We switch from being this very repeated play, procedural system world to something linear, story-driven, single playthrough kind of model. When we switched, we had you know, the early version of our procedural generation system, so we could procedurally build a world. We did have some of our AI, and we had some of our core gameplay. We kept pretty much all of that. I don't think there's a lot we really removed from it. There were a number of things we realized we needed to add. So for example, we wanted to have a lot more complex and interesting interactions in the world. So we had to build out systems for allowing you to actually have conversations with people in the world and to interact with them. Lovely weather. Lovely day for it. It made also the quest system a lot more complex. We want to tell a story, which means our quest system needs to be able to track a more complex series of events and allow our level designers to actually describe more complex things happening in the world. When I arrived, uh, Matt kind of dropped me the system and tell me, OK, it's yours now. You need to make it work and make it better. You're like, um, like a detective two weeks after the crime. The body is on the floor. It's rotten. A lot of people have trampled the room, this kind of thing. And you're like, there, what I can do? That was a bit scary. But I think the thing that stressed me the most is the fact that for gameplay reason, for artistic reason, they were doing things that were not considered first, and they were getting good results, but sometimes it was breaking the system. Everybody feels better if that door stays broken. You, us. Everybody. When we're first doing procedural, it's very tempting to assume that, well, we're going to create a machine that spits out game content for us, so hey, we just have to build the machine and then we get all this value at the other end. It's really tough to take that sort of procedural system 
and generate a story that you've already built. It really constrained us on what the procedural system had to do. It was tough to randomize the world a lot more because we needed certain encounters to happen in a certain order, in certain locations in the world. We wanted to make sure they weren't too far away from each other. We didn't want everything to be all clumped together so there'd be one interesting corner of the world and the rest of it be very barren. You're asking this you know, random system to give you the answer you already expect. Have you forgotten your joy? Traditionally, the, the designer have a much finer control because the world is static. And so they can request help or support from programmers about specific things. We want, I don't know, more AI around this place or we want this special effect there. It's really connected to the fact that the world is static. In our case, uh, the world was different every time. So it was a bit more abstract. You didn't say this house uh, is there. You were just saying through the tool that this house is on the first island. So it was a bit more abstract way of working. There had to be a lot of back and forth in terms of somebody would design something, we'd integrate it into the game, we'd find cases where it failed, and then oftentimes it would have to be a joint effort between designers and programmers to figure out, okay, why exactly does this fail? Because everything could look good on the surface, but then the procedural systems would mix it together in a way that we just did not expect. There's nothing to worry about. The interesting thing that actually worked out in our favor, although I'm not sure I would start building a game this way, is actually the procedural generation system. While it was challenging to get it to spit out the right thing, it made it really easy for us to reorganize the world as we went. Because it was procedurally generated, we had a lot of metadata about the world. We knew what the overall structure of the world looked like because that's how we planned things. We have very deep information about where all the roads are. We have a lot of information about how the terrain is constructed and how different regions of the world are set up. We could take advantage of a lot of that to more easily figure out what pieces to move in and out. At one point we sat down with a designer and he told me that a part of the game was too long. The player had too many buildings to visit. And so he said, well, could we split an island in two? I say, yeah, of course you can. It's just two lines. You, you get there, you say, instead of putting there, you put it there, and that's it. Fairly late in game development, we were able to say, these events we have happening in Chapter 2, would we like to see them happen in Chapter 4, and then take some of the areas in Chapter 4 and bring them forward. And that was five minutes of work to just edit the description of how the world should be built, and the engine happily spit out the newly configured world. From the computer point of view, there were something like an Excel sheet, which say this thing go into the first island or the second or the third. So we just changed the number, and for all the following generations, the content has been moved. That aspect of it was great. I mean, that really allowed us to really iterate on a lot of things, like the structure of the world and how things were laid out, which in normally in a linear handcrafted game would be incredibly painful and expensive. That's the kind of thing we were able to do after everybody got up to speed on the way to integrate the different parts of the system. That was really a net win uh, because it was, um, it was a bit like magic. I suspect, uh, I can't say this with absolute certainty, but I suspect that you're more likely to get into trouble trying to preserve an old system and twist it to a new purpose than just take what you've learned, the knowledge you've gained, and just, you know, scrap it and restart that part. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. The point at which you're best positioned to build the game is just the point you've finished building it. You've answered all the questions, you have a pretty good idea what works and what doesn't work, but you don't know that while you're developing it. So you're operating off of experience and a bunch of guesses and really hoping you're doing the right thing. And if you got to do it all over again, you'd do such a better job doing it. Yeah.